Heredity and Opportunity You are not barred from attaining greatness by heredity, no matter who or what your ancestors may have been, or how unlearned or lowly their station, the upward way is open for you. There is no such thing as inheriting a fixed mental position. No matter how small the mental capital we receive from our parents, it may be increased. No man is born incapable of growth. Heredity counts for something. We are born with subconscious mental tendencies, as, for instance, a tendency to melancholy or cowardice or to ill temper, but all these subconscious tendencies may be overcome. When the real man awakens and comes forth, he can throw them off very easily. Nothing of this kind need keep you down. If you have inherited undesirable mental tendencies, you can eliminate them and put desirable tendencies in their places. An inherited mental trait is a habit of thought of your father or mother impressed upon your subconscious mind. You can substitute the opposite impression by forming the opposite habit of thought. You can substitute a habit of cheerfulness for a tendency to despondency. You can overcome cowardice or ill temper. Heredity may count for something, too, in an inherited confirmation of the skull. There is something in phrenology, if not so much as its exponents claim for it. It is true that the different faculties are localized in the brain, and that the power of a faculty depends upon the number of active brain cells in its area. A faculty whose brain area is large is likely to act with more power than one whose cranial section is small. Hence, persons with certain conformations of the skull show talent as musicians, orators, mechanics, and so on. It has been argued from this that a man's cranial formation must, to a great extent, decide his station in life. But this is an error. It has been found that a small brain section with many fine and active cells gives as powerful expression to faculty as a larger brain with coarser cells. And it has been found that by turning the principle of power into any section of the brain with the will and purpose to develop a particular talent, the brain cells may be multiplied indefinitely. Any faculty, power, or talent you possess, no matter how small or rudimentary, may be increased. You can multiply the brain cells in this particular area until it acts as powerfully as you wish. It is true that you can act most easily through those faculties that are now most largely developed. You can do, with the least effort, the things which come naturally. But it is also true that if you will make the necessary effort, you can develop any talent. You can do what you desire to do and become what you want to be. When you fix upon some ideal and proceed as here and after directed, all the power of your being is turned into the faculties required in the realization of that ideal. More blood and nerve force go to the corresponding sections of the brain, and the cells are quickened, increased, and multiplied in number. The proper use of the mind of man will build a brain capable of doing what the mind wants to do. The brain does not make the man. The man makes the brain. Your place in life is not fixed by heredity, nor are you condemned to the lower levels by circumstances or lack of opportunity. The principle of power in man is sufficient for all the requirements of his soul. No possible combination of circumstances can keep him down if he makes his personal attitude right and determines to rise. The power which formed man and purposed him for growth also controls the circumstances of society, industry, and government. And this power is never divided against itself. The power which is in you is in the things around you. And when you begin to move forward, the things will arrange themselves for your advantage, as described in later chapters of this book. Man was formed for growth and all things external 
were designed to promote his growth. No sooner does a man awaken his soul and enter on the advancing way than he finds that not only is God for him, but nature, society, and his fellow men are for him also. And all things work together for his good if he obeys the law. Poverty is no bar to greatness, for poverty can always be removed. Martin Luther, as a child, sang in the streets for bread. Linnaeus, the naturalist, had only forty dollars with which to educate himself. He mended his own shoes and often had to beg meals from his friends. Hugh Miller, apprenticed to a stonemason, began to study geology in a quarry. George Stevenson, inventor of the locomotive engine and one of the greatest of civil engineers, was a coal miner working in a mine when he awakened and began to think. James Watt was a sickly child and was not strong enough to be sent to school. Abraham Lincoln was a poor boy. In each of these cases, we see a principle of power in the man which lifts him above all opposition and adversity. There is a principle of power in you. If you use it and apply it in a certain way, you can overcome all heredity and master all circumstances and conditions and become a great and powerful personality. End of chapter 2